A famous result in orbital mechanics known as Bertrand's theorem states that if you have a central force that is a pure function of radial distance, any function of radius, there are only two functions that will form stable, closed orbits. And as it happens, both of the functions are power laws, a pure power of the radius, and both of the orbits are ellipses. There's the exponent minus 2, which is Newton's law of gravitation and gives you Keplerian orbits, which are ellipses with the center of force at one focus. And there's the exponent plus 1, which is Hooke's law of simple harmonic motion, also known as the spring force. That one gives you an ellipse with the center of force right in the middle. And technically there's a third solution, but it applies only to perfectly circular orbits. This exponent is important because if you think about a theoretical alternate universe with a different number of dimensions, the exponent changes. And this is easy to see with light. In our universe, as light streams away from its source, it spreads out proportional to the square of the distance. So for a fixed amount of light, its brightness decreases according to the inverse square law. But in two dimensions, there would be less room for the light to spread out. So it would follow an inverse linear law. And in four dimensions, there's more space, and it would follow an inverse cube law. Gravity works in the same way, spreading out, as it were, by a 1 minus d power law. And based on Bertrand's theorem, that means the only number of dimensions where gravitational orbits work are our own three dimensions. And zero dimensions, which is really just a mathematical abstraction because there's no space to move in. Except that's not exactly correct. Or rather, it's not correct in the way you're probably thinking. Bertrand's theorem says that these two are the only functions that give you stable and closed orbits. Other exponents give you orbits that are neither stable nor closed, but unstable does not mean that the planet will fly away into deep space or fall into the sun. The mathematical definition of instability really means that objects on similar orbits won't stay together. They'll drift apart exponentially over time, but they can still both remain on perfectly acceptable orbits. To see what I mean, let's look at an inverse linear power force. This is what an orbit would look like in a two-dimensional universe. And as you can see, the orbit is not closed. It doesn't return to its starting point, but instead loops around like a spirograph. But just looping around like this isn't a problem physically. Now let's start two particles orbiting in the same place with slightly different trajectories. If you follow them long enough, their paths diverge, and they wind up on completely different orbits. This is not what you get in our universe with our inverse square law. Here, if you start two particles with nearby trajectories, they stay close together. And they both return to the same starting point. This is what we mean by stability. It's hard to nudge them completely off track. In two dimensions, if you nudge a particle off track, it drifts farther and farther away and winds up on a completely different orbit. This is the mathematical definition of instability. But notice what it's not doing. It's not falling into the sun or flying out of the solar system entirely. That's because even though it's not a closed orbit, it's still a bounded orbit. It still stays between predictable inner and outer limits. And you can see this if you plot out the effective potential energy of orbits with different exponents. The effective potential energy is the potential energy that an object feels in the rotating frame of the orbit. That quantity is different from the true potential energy of just gravity, because in a rotating frame of reference, there's a centrifugal force. To calculate the centrifugal force for orbits, you have to start with the potential energy and apply conservation of angular momentum, like this, 
And when you do, you actually get an inverse cube law, except directed outward rather than inward. The resulting effective potential is the potential energy of gravity plus the centrifugal force, and it looks like this. The potential energy shoots up to infinity near the star. It's hard to hit the star because your orbital motion will cause you to miss, and it approaches a constant far from the star. Usually we call that zero, but we don't have to. And in between, there's a local minimum. And if a planet is in that local minimum, it doesn't matter what crazy orbit it has. It's going to stay in that local minimum because it doesn't have enough energy to get out of it. Its orbit will have a well-defined minimum and maximum radius. And that applies to other exponents as well. Here's an inverse linear force. Here's a constant force, also known as a funnel potential. This is approximately how the strong nuclear force works. A spring force. And I can even have a higher exponent than the spring force. And they all still have a local minimum potential. All of these exponents will produce bounded orbits. So planets in two dimensions could still orbit stars for billions of years like this, as long as they don't get too close to each other. But this made me wonder, what does it look like if you keep increasing it to larger and larger values? Here, I'm increasing the exponent from plus 2 to plus 100. And if you watch, you'll notice something. The orbits are getting closer and closer to straight lines. With a very large positive exponent, if the force is a normal amount at the planet's initial position, then it rapidly drops to near zero at even a slightly smaller distance. So closer to the star, the planet has effectively no forces on it, and it can move in a straight line. But farther from the star, the force rapidly grows to infinity. So the planet immediately bounces back if it goes even a little over that line. Essentially, the planet is bouncing around freely in a spherical region that it can't get out of. This doesn't make sense for planets, but it does show up in quantum physics in the form of the infinite spherical well, which can be used as a crude model of an atomic nucleus, where a particle can move freely inside the sphere but can't leave it. So we can increase the exponent of the central force without limit. The trouble is, that's not all that physically meaningful. After all, if we're trying to mimic gravity, these exponents would correspond to a negative number of dimensions. What happens if we use negative exponents? Famously, gravity in extra dimensions of space, with an inverse cube law or higher, produces orbits that are unstable in the colloquial sense. That is, unbounded orbits. And to see why, we can look again at the effective potential. Here is the effective potential for a normal inverse square law of gravity with a local minimum. If we make the exponent more negative, that stays the same at first. The local minimum just gets shallower. until we get to an inverse cube law in four dimensions. Remember that the centrifugal force is an inverse cube law pointed outward. And now our four-dimensional gravity is an inverse cube law pointed inward. The same force in opposite directions, and the effective potential is zero. In the rotating frame, a planet can move completely freely in radial distance, as if there are no forces on it, so it moves in a straight line and a straight line in a rotating frame becomes a spiral in a non-rotating frame, eventually hitting the sun or flying off to infinity. And what happens if we make the exponent more negative? Well now the effective potential curve is flipped over. It doesn't have a local minimum anymore, it has a local maximum. And this makes the orbits both unstable and unbounded. The planets won't stay in orbit which is exactly why orbits don't work in four or more dimensions. Although you can still get interesting shapes for some initial conditions, 
For example, if you have an inverse fourth power central force, the orbit can be a cardioid with the Sun at the cusp. For an inverse fifth power, you can get a circle, but it's a circle that passes through the origin instead of around it. For an inverse seventh power, it's a lemniscate, or a mathematical figure eight with the Sun at the center. Then, for more negative powers, you get these hook shapes, which become more and more extreme until you get to negative infinity, where essentially the force is infinite inside some critical radius and zero outside it. At that point, the planet falls directly into the star on a straight line in zero time, ignoring relativity. It's not even like a black hole, because the planet isn't affected at all at larger radii. It's more like a sphere of annihilation in Dungeons & Dragons, where anything that touches it disappears immediately. And here's one more puzzle I wondered about. What about fractional powers? I showed, going from inverse square to inverse cube, that the potential curves are all part of a smooth continuum. Does anything interesting happen when we fill in the gaps? I ran a few of them, and the results surprised me, because some of these orbits look an awful lot like they're closed except only after multiple revolutions. Here's an example with an inverse 2 and 3 quarter power. This orbit comes back to its starting point after only two revolutions. Not exactly, but suspiciously close, and some of my early tests were even closer. And from what I can find, the fact that some fractional exponents produce closed orbits is a known result. Goldstein, Poole, and Safko's Classical Mechanics textbook remarks upon it, but that's only indirectly and in passing. Is this a flaw in Bertrand's theorem? Well, no. As far as I can tell, this is just an artifact of precession. In the math, you can model these orbits as ellipses, except they aren't closed, because they precess around the origin. It just so happens that with these parameters, you get a precession rate that equals a rational number, in this case one half. But they're still not stable orbits. And if you put in some other orbit, you can get something completely different. Bertrand's theorem states that for a solution to work, it has to work for all orbits. And because Bertrand's theorem is ultimately based on solving a cubic polynomial, it can only have the three solutions I mentioned at the beginning. The spring force, the inverse square force, and perfectly circular orbits, which don't really tell us anything about the force function to begin with. And that is how orbits look in every possible dimension, even the impossible ones.